Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is an amended version of the 23rd Psalm. It's called a David Psalm. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I am not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head, my cup brims, brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. Thank you, Mickey. When I was 14 years old, I had the pleasure of having mono and my tonsils taken out all in the same year. Both of these events uh, fell in the fall, as I remember being sick around my birthday, which happens to fall in November. I recovered from mono, and as I recollect, my tonsils were removed right before Christmas. So you can imagine that just wasn't a good, good year for me. As you might imagine, I missed a large amount of school that year. And because of that, I was required to attend summer school to ensure that I matriculated into the ninth grade the following year. My parents worked opposite shifts. My mom worked the traditional nine to five while my father worked a late night or third shift. And because of that scheduling, it was my mother's responsibility. She would drop me off at school before she went to work and, and would come back in the early afternoon to pick me up. But because her day wasn't over, I was forced to accompany her back to her job and set up shop in the medical office where she worked. In the break room, I would try to rush through and finish my homework as fast as I could so that I'd be able to read the books of my own choosing. Fortunately, my mother's job was close to a bookstore and we would pop in from time to time in between those trips from the school into her office. It must have been during one of those trips where I, thumbing and browsing through the science fiction and fantasy section, I came across the author known as H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft is considered by many to be the father of the modern science fiction horror story genre. I still have the anthology of his work my mother bought me that day, often pulling it out in the late fall as the days grow shorter and the night creeps closer. Lovecraft was a talented writer and a wonderful storyteller, but perhaps the reason I became a fan of his writing was due to his ability to name certain conditions of the human experience, those of which dealt most often with what we as people were afraid of. He wrote many stories of oddities and monsters, such as the terrifying cosmic entity known as Cthulhu, but his driving force behind these manifestations wasn't the size or the destruction these creatures like Cthulhu could cause, but instead it was the fear they invoked. The monsters that jumped off of Lovecraft's page were constructed using humanity's shared fears, of which there are many. But Lovecraft would say one, one sort of fear ruled above them all. One he saw as the originator, and source of all others. Lovecraft would state, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind or humanity is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. The unknown, the unseen. Now it's like that saying, not knowing what's really coming around the corner. Don't believe him? Close your eyes for a minute this morning. If you're here, close your eyes. Maybe if you're home, close your eyes. I want you to kind of walk with me through this. With eyes closed, hear these words. Now I want you to imagine you're walking along a winding dirt path at night. The path takes dips and you can hear the sound of your footsteps as they fall. The moon is shining brightly, which helps you see the large open field you're about to cross. 
You enter the field and the tall grass rubs across your lower legs. You notice the clouds moving across the sky and realize that in a few moments, they'll pass in front of the moon and obstruct your view. You hasten your steps and, and that's when you notice something. Just off in the distance, a figure, a silhouette. Whoever, whoever it is, they're, they're, they're not moving or, or, or are they? Is it a scarecrow blowing in the breeze? Is it moving closer? Your skin begins to prickle and all the hair on your body stands up. You're not sure whether to stand still or break into a sprint. You stare at the figure fixated. You just can't make out what it is and, and it's this not knowing, this thing that is causing your heart to beat out of your chest. That's the kind of fear Lovecraft wrote about, the fear of the unknown the fear of what might happen if the world we know collapses around us and we tailspin into chaos. You can open your eyes. Our world right now may feel a lot like a Lovecraft novel at this moment. Our perception of reality has shifted and will continue to do so almost daily. The other day, my family and I were out for a walk over in the cemetery that's close by our home, and we came across a person we had never met before, but it was one that I had exchanged several emails with in the past. She recognized me because I'm recognizable, I have a big beard and blue glasses, and so as we approached each other, we stopped several rows of headstones short of coming in contact. We held our conversation with more air between us than I'm used to. It was unfamiliar, and I confess it was something I wasn't sure if I wanted to become familiar. We tiptoed around the awkwardness of it all and made plans to really connect with each other when the world seemed normal again. This moment was just one of many this past week. You know, just earlier, a few days before that, I was approached by an individual I didn't know that well, but they needed help, and we talked for a little while about their needs, and as we parted or were about to part ways, I fought this pastoral urge to shake their hand. I relented, though, and did, and then sheepishly joked that we should both use hand sanitizer right afterwards. We both laughed, and we laughed and did that. We parted ways, but I couldn't shake that experience. It bothered me. It made me uncomfortable for many reasons. It challenged my perception of how I view my role as a pastor about how I should be willing to come across all sorts of visible and invisible lines in order to meet people where they are. It also produced this Lovecraftian type of fear that made me anxious. I don't know that person. I didn't know who they were. What, what, what if they were sick? What if I get sick? What if I take this sickness home to my family? It's a spiral. The spiral of anxiety, the spiral of hysteria, the spiral of worry. It's the kind of stuff that keeps you up at night. The allowance of fear into our lives can, to our lives can overtake us as our comfortable realities come crashing down, replaced by the unwelcome chaos of what might or could be. A few weeks ago, I mentioned the name Frank Tupper. Dr. Tupper was a Baptist theologian and someone who, like Lovecraft, wrote about fear. He wrote of his personal experience in watching his wife battle cancer and the chaos it brought into the life of his family. In the midst of that time, Dr. Tupper said he had several dreams that woke him at night. He describes one in this way. Night on a dark, stormy sea, winds howled as a wave after wave crashed against the craggy shore, running, running out of breath. But I was always running, running alone into the darkness, driven by an overwhelming sense of fear. No, terror. Icy waters lapped at my heavy feet. The cold chilled me to the bone. The wet sand pulled at every footstep. Whenever I looked over my shoulder at the sea, I saw him staring at me, laughing, his dark face etched on the white surf of rushing waves. It was a face of terror. 
Large, lidless eyes, they stared, they glared, they ensnared my mind. A wide mouth with massive shining teeth formed a vicious grin that spewed mocking laughter. His sinister crackling filled the night rising and falling with the wind. As the waves would ebb and flow, I could read the cold white night light that blinked out his name. Chaos. 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 The world now stands on the same sea as Dr. Tupper once stood. We stand out and look at the same grinning face. The blinking, the blinking light, which is perhaps our own smartphones or tablets, illuminated our faces at night as we read the headlines from one of the many news sources. The words blinking back at us, chaos, chaos, chaos. How do we confront such a thing? How do we stand on the shore of the uncertainty and not turn away from our own fear that stares back at us wrapped in the mask of chaos? Chaos, that thing that looks to replace the source of who we are. Chaos, the usurper of a throne that is intended and belongs to another. We hear in Psalm 23, we often gather, we hear this when we gather to mourn. We hear that psalm. And perhaps that's why we associate it most with the difficult times of our lives. Perhaps we have been inclined to recite the psalm in an effort to find the, the positive in the bleakest of moments. Sure, things are bad, but hey, we're told they could be worse. Reading the 23rd Psalm in this way doesn't address the focus and the beauty of what actually lies in these verses. The power we see the author, the writer here invoke is one that says, do not give darkness, do not give chaos or fear, do not give it power by shuffling around it in an attempt to find something better to justify it. Instead, the author of the psalm says, put your attention on the shepherd in the story. The shepherd in this story doesn't try to refocus the attention of the person going through their trial. The shepherd doesn't say, look over here and just pay attention to the good things in hopes that when we refocus, all the chaos will be gone. That doesn't happen, no. The shepherd instead acknowledges the darkness and walks through the uncertainty with the psalmist. Then the shepherd's presence counters that of chaos and replaces it with life-giving substance. The shepherd offers the psalmist the knowledge that darkness and fear cannot be allowed to overturn the compassion of the one that offers not only comfort, but reassurance and courage. Here in Psalm 23, we see these attributes being compared to what we think of when we think of a typical shepherd, you know, one that might provide for a flock, that, that, uh, provide for a flock those type of things that you protect something, you protection from predators. But we also see a shepherd that restores the soul. This is a shepherd that not only protects life, but one that gives life. That sort of knowledge and nourishment is needed when we enter into the darkest valley of our lives, the ones we believe we have to walk alone. Those valleys, we don't know when we go through them, we don't know if we can survive. But the psalmist promises us that in those, moments, in those moments, we don't have to walk alone. This doesn't mean that the darkness will uh, dissipate just because the shepherd is with us. No, the darkness is still there. The chaos is still there. The fear is still there. And it's all very real. Only now, when we face those things, we have the power that there is something greater that can overcome them. And that power is the presence of the shepherd. The presence of the living God, who both understands our fear of walking through darkness while also offering com companionship that promises to sustain us. While the darkness might influence and cause us to fear, the darkness cannot and will not cause the shepherd to fear. The psalmist continues with a promise, one that sees us get through all those trials and one that sees us come out on the other side of that dark valley. Now, imagine you've gone through one of those situations in your own life and you get to the end of that and instead of coming out on the other side and celebrating with a banquet feast with all your friends and support supporters, you're seated at a table beside all your enemies. Not the ideal scenario, right? 
The psalmist says here that while you sit face to face with fear and anxiety and depression and worry, that the shepherd, that God will not only be with you, but claim you as God's own in their presence. The scene is one of anointing. The, the psalmist's head with oil is one that states that we who are finite and who have limited ability to receive understanding are offered all of God's loving presence that is without limit. What does an anointing look like? I'll let Dr. Tupper fill you in on that as well. He had another dream after this, and in this he shares his experience. During the near darkness of the hour before dawn, I watched my teachers and mentors following one by one behind each other, but beyond me, unaware of me, standing off in the shadows, conscious of each other and their proposed destination. They wore dark robes with hooded cowls and which almost hid their faces as they hastened one after the other, some on sacred pilgrimages. Sure, the last one had gone by. I felt in line and followed, not knowing where or why, dressed in ordinary clothes, no robe, no fold of piety to cover me. The path we followed, single file, was shredding darkness on all sides, suddenly opened into a vast field of grass, awash in the brilliance of morning sunshine. I saw my monkish mentors gathered in silence on the other side of the field of green, ringed in a semicircle around eminence, a painting of the sea, a magnificent scene. The distant sky, a churning gray and blue, white-capped waves breaking, waters crashing against a rocky shore, a, co a collage of blue and green and white and black and gray, a swirling, dizzying portrait of the sea. I moved around the half-circled masterpiece from one corner to the other, finding no place to stand. I could not see their painting of the sea. I could not join in the stillness and silence of their captivity. I felt deep disappointment sweep over me, why did I not have a place to be? Disappointment sank into despair. Did they not know the difference between a painting, even a masterpiece, and reality, the undescribable wonder of the sea? Without knowing or why, I suddenly found myself beyond the edge of the painting. I was actually behind it, dropping gently yet rapidly through a comfortable smoky haze. When I stopped descending, an unnoticed silence discontinued. I stood alone on the wet sandy shore in the presence of the sea. Its waters extended endlessly beyond the horizon, touching infinitely. With the sound of waves rolling and crashing against the shore, they roared like the majestic dawning of creation, deafening in its might, colors blurred into every shade of blue and black and green and white. I tasted salt in my mouth and breathed it into my life. The light of the eastern sky broke through, billowing clouds of cotton and blue, dark clouds receding, retreating before the light, towering black cliffs loomed massive behind me, laid alongside one another, like giant steeples of stone, reaching up until lost in the mist of blanketing clouds above. I stood in the awesome, infinite presence of the sea, of the ineffable mystery, and simultaneously, I saw myself from above one speck on a vast shining shore, a shoreline stretching farther than the eye could see, lost in the distance to the embrace of the sea. And I felt significant. I felt significant only because of my insignificance. Yet I stood in the presence of ultimate reality, of another, of the holy other. I felt acceptance and affirmation. I felt security and peace. I belonged to the sea. It had let me be to become a valued entity. It had named me to forget me now as an impossibility. God knew me. God knew my name, the journey of my life. And God loved me. At this moment in time, we, like Dr. Tupper, we find ourselves as a global people in a very dark valley. 
Humanity stands on the edge of the shore, staring out into the chaos which looks to devour us with fear. My role as a pastor is to give you a message of hope, and, and that's just not because it's my job or what's expected, but because I believe that if a pastor can't share a message of hope, then they're just in the wrong line of work. My message of hope to you today is to tell you that we can step into that valley, that we can push our boat into that sea and aim our path square at that grinning face of chaos because we are not alone in our existence. A shepherd goes with us, has always gone with us. This shepherd will be there to help us confront this new peril that lies before us. That shepherd would help us combat it through all sorts of means, both discovered and yet still unknown. The shepherd will see us use the resources that we have to extend those to our neighbors and to do all these things in love. And when the darkness lifts and the seas calm, we will all gather at a table. We will set beside all the things that sought to destroy us, but only now it will be us smiling. It will be us cutting a grin as the oil, or maybe what a better image of anointing is, is when God bends down to kiss us on the head. When that kiss hits our foreheads or that oil hits our forehead and God's restoration and union with us is felt yet again, we'll let the darkness recede and all that will be left will be the creator and the shepherd's creation. Amen. Amen.